mute yourself, make yourself known to us. How's it going, Babs? Fine, it's going well. How are you? Good. I can't believe it's been a year. I like what you're doing with your hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. How's everything off at the Columbus House? You know, things at the Columbus House are having a, we're, we're in a good moment, I would say. We're in a good moment. It's been a, it's been a challenging winter. Um, a lot of changes afoot. We're back. So I'm talking to you from our primary shelter building on the boulevard, and we actually have clients uh, full time back in this building in the in the shelter spaces for the first time since April 2020. So wow, 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 changes. wow, that's a big deal. Yeah. All right. So what's the great give goal today? What 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 are y'all hoping to raise? Um, we'd like to raise all the money, Babs. We'd like to raise <laughs> all the money. I'll check in with my development team. We were very, we were very fortunate to have a seven thousand dollar match, which okay. I suspect we probably met yesterday because when I checked in yesterday, we were doing great. But I'll find out from them this morning. Okay, okay, all um, right. So, so why should people care about Columbus House? I mean, Columbus House has a mission that sells itself. I'm just kidding, Babs. I think people in this community have already open their hearts in a lot of ways to Columbus House. We have a lot of love and support in the community. And I think it's because, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Columbus House, our mission is to serve people experiencing homelessness in this community. Um, and so many people um, resonate with that mission. They understand that the deep inequality in our society, which allows some people, some of our neighbors to sleep outside, isn't acceptable to them. Uh, and Columbus House exists for that energy to say this isn't acceptable we're going to support people who are in this dire crisis we're going to get them into stable housing and we're going to work on the solutions that'll prevent people from having this experience in the future okay so how many people do you serve so columbus house serves um just under three thousand people a year okay which um, sometimes surprises people because they think of Columbus House as being like the building on the boulevard, which is the primary shelter building. <clears throat> but Columbus House is actually in its 40th birthday year. So we're having a big birthday this year. Um, we were founded in 1982. And we serve people now in four counties. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. See, oh, see that is surprising because we don't know that. Yeah. So Columbus House actually serves people in four counties and has a, a really big presence in Middlesex County and in Middletown, um, providing services to people experiencing homelessness there. We support um, two family shelters, one in Wallingford and one in Middletown, in addition to the work that we do in New Haven. So for people who aren't familiar with and they're like, you know, a lot of times what we hear about Babs is people who are like, I see somebody panhandling at my exit on on the merit i see people exiting or on the wilbur cross parkway i see people panhandling at my stop um on whitney avenue what's going on with that and um the answer is or, or or what do we do about that and the answer for us is this huge continuum of services so for people who are in a situation where they're unsheltered they're actually living outside we have outreach workers who go out into the places where people live that aren't to use a technical term, fit for human habitation. So they go under the bridges, they go behind buildings, they go in church stairwells, they go um, close to the Walmart um, over on Fox and Boulevard. There's a lot of spots where um, our outreach workers go and they work with people who are living outside. And the goal that people have when they're living outside may be to come into shelter. It may be to, come, to go directly into housing. It may be to sit, be safe and alive while they're living there. Um, and so we support them in that. Then we run this shelter, which is really just a stopping place for people on their path to permanent housing. It's not, you know, it's a way station on the way. And then we support over 300 people who are in permanent supportive housing. And permanent supportive housing, Babs, is a model that is incredibly effective. 98% of the clients that we put and we support in permanent supportive housing stay housed. So these are people who've had really significant challenges to staying housed in the past. They might have significant disabilities, they may have mental health issues, they may have co-occurring substance use disorders. And um, with help, they can be happily, stably housed and um, go on to be the, you know, creative, caring, contributing members of the society that we all aspire to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm fascinated by this uh, family housing situation um what does that look like talk a little bit about what what some what sort of families do you see coming 
um, to to use your services? Well, you know, I think it's probably not always what people expect. I'm thinking particularly of a family that we served recently where um, it was a mother and a son and the mother is a healthcare worker. And she had some unexpected bills. And in our economy, there's so many people who are working people and their wages don't support um, a lot of saving, right? So when you're in a situation where you're a single parent, you have a kid with um, a lot of needs and you have a job that pays the bills, but just barely, um, a lot of people find themselves in a situation where their unstable housing becomes homelessness. And we're really fortunate at Columbus House that the two family shelters we run are actually townhouses. So if you saw them, Babs, you would not be like, oh, that's a shelter building. You would just be like, that's an apartment. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad that we're able to give families, um, you know, some space and like a comfortable environment. Because I think for children, we know that it's a really traumatic, um, one of the ACEs, right? Uh, early childhood traumatic experience that has lifelong repercussions to experience homelessness. Mm. So what was it like for y'all during the height of the pandemic? And, and, and what did you learn from that because the pandemic is still with us. And if this comes back around in the way that it did, what do you do? Are you prepared? Did you learn lessons? What? So many things. So first of all, one thing that we learned is when something really devastating, like a global pandemic hits this community, this community will support people who are in dire need of help, like people experiencing homelessness. So the people of Greater New Haven came out and supported Columbus House and the work that we do um, really lined up shoulder to shoulder with us to make sure that people were safe, that they had access to vaccines, that they had access to medical care, that they were safely housed. And that's why we were able to get people into the hotel early on in the pandemic. Um, I'm really happy to report we had zero COVID deaths in the shelter population. So we didn't have anybody, um, we certainly had people get COVID, but we did not have COVID deaths. And I think that's totally a testament to the safe environment we were able to put people in. Using the hotel as um, shelter was a big learning experience for us, for our clients. In some ways, it was terrific. Our clients had a lot of autonomy, independence. They had a better sense of safety. They could come and go. They had access to you know, a bathroom and a kitchen whenever they needed it. Um, in other ways, it was challenging as a shelter because, like I said, shelter is a way station. It's not your permanent home. And the hotel could be so home-like that for some people, they were like, why do I need to leave this? This is pretty great. Um, which I was glad that we were able to give them that experience, but also really wanted them to have the benefit of an actual permanent home in a place that they could stay. So those are some lessons that we learned um, from the hotel experience. And then the thing that's happening right now, Babs, that's really, I think, the big takeaway is that we have hundreds of people, and I can give you the number because I just got it this morning, who are matched right now with the housing subsidy. So they have a voucher assigned to them, or they have some other way that the government can help them pay their rent in a short or long-term way, and they cannot find a unit of housing to rent. Oh, the but that's true for people who are not um, unhoused, right? Like exactly, just trying to find an apartment. Yeah. So when the housing market is tight, like it is right now, it compresses, right? So people who are trying to buy a house are being priced out and they become renters and they push out people who might have rented that apartment. And the people who get incredibly squeezed are the people who are already experiencing homelessness and trying to get into the housing market. So that's the unprecedented moment that we're in right now. And the takeaway that Columbus House has from that is we have got to have more deeply affordable housing. And this isn't like 10 years from now, we need to have more deeply affordable housing now. And a challenge for us, and I would love to know what you think, given your platform as a communicator, is how we help people understand the extent to which the lack of affordable housing is driving so much um, instability for people in a, at a range of income levels in our community. Mm. We're, Columbus House sort of represents the extreme manifestation of that, right? The poorest people who are so driven out of the housing market that they literally are sleeping outside. But it's that's one manifestation of this bigger problem, which is there aren't there isn't a matchup between housing units that people can afford and the, the amount that people a money that people have to spend on housing. So 
I think that's a big challenge for our community is to get people who aren't personally affected by that to understand and care about that problem. Because it's kind of wonky, right? It's kind of wonky. Yes. And, I, you know, I, I will say as an old politician um, that, you know, it, it is going to require public-private conversations. You know, um, Elm City communities, i.e. the Housing Authority, has made great strides in trying to sort of overhaul um, public housing spaces and, uh, and uh, create opportunities for people who never had access to public housing. Uh, I think it's going to require political will at the highest legislative level. I mean, I think um, HUD has to have imaginative leadership and that imaginative leadership has to um, inspire and empower at the state level so that the state levels can empower at the local level. So it, I mean, it is about political will. I will always say that it's about political will and, and what yeah. is, is required. You know, so. I think that's I mean, that's always where I go to that it's a matter of political will, because, you know, at a place like Columbus House, we're working on um, housing and homelessness. It's different than other social service providers that you'll talk to during the Great Give. Right. Because it's not like we're serving people with mental illness and our goal is to serve people with mental illness. We're serve people in experiencing homelessness and homelessness is a solvable problem. It's not a problem that as a society we need to tolerate or have at all. It's also a modern phenomenon, like modern mass homelessness, long-term chronic homelessness. It's something we've gotten used to in this era, but didn't exist when our grandparents were our age. So mm. it's also, um, it's something that we have to recognize, like we can't get comfortable with. We should not get comfortable with. We should not yes. accept as being- and, and we and I think to your point, we can't just expect Columbus House to do it by themselves. Do you know what I mean? Like oh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> Columbus House doesn't act on its own. I mean, we do a lot of work, but we do it in tandem with a, a huge array of other service providers who are part of the Greater New Haven Regional Alliance to End Homelessness. We do it with our partners in city, state, and national government. We do it with partnership with literally thousands of volunteers. And I really want to call out in particular, Babs, the faith communities, because the faith communities are groups of people who share our mission, like at our, at their core and at our core, we sort of have the same mission, which is a belief in the dignity and beauty of all people. And um, the, the, the fact that all of those people deserve respect and, and, you know, the basics of a decent life. And so um, I really want to recognize how much those communities, those faith communities show up for the people in great need in this community. It's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, you're raising money. What will you do with the money you raised today? Do you have a, a specific uh, earmark for it or? No, I mean, the sad reality, Babs, is that we have to raise money to make government programs possible. So we have to we have to raise money just to have the things that people think of as being government programs like a homeless shelter, for example, exist. But some of the things that we're able to do when we do fundraising is provide um, basic needs to people. So for example, when somebody moves into their permanent home, we make sure that they have all the stuff that they need to make that house a home. Volunteers contribute that directly by assembling welcome kits and that we can used to give to people when they're moving into units. And then we also use donations um, to buy those things. We use donations to buy bus passes, which are a really big deal. Bus passes probably sound like a minor thing. How can that really matter? But if you're experiencing homelessness and you don't have income, to get to an apartment to look at it or to talk to the landlord becomes a huge problem. To yes. get to a job interview, to get to a doctor's appointment becomes a huge problem. So one of the things that we do where we don't have a stable funding source to support our clients is um, buy bus passes. So we use money to support basic needs. We use it to support bus passes. We use it to run programs that aren't funded by the government, like Abraham's Tent. Are you familiar with Abraham's Tent, Babs? Uh, yes, I was a member of the Church of the Redeemer um, on Whitney and Cold Spring, and that was one of our, our we supported that program. I sat with the gentleman um, because we had shifts and I sat with the gentleman. I played cards. I watched movies. Uh, I just um, sat and talked to them. So yes, we did that at our church. So I, I know that mission. I know that that program very well. Our church, you know, as you know, Church of the Redeemer 
um, is no longer um, a, a, a working church. We sold the building. It's becoming an apartments. But I hear Abraham 10 is still moving through churches, right? It's still part of a yeah. church community. So your listeners who aren't familiar with the program, I think Abraham's Tent is one of the beautiful things that Columbus House does. It helps create very greatly needed shelter beds in the winter by coordinating with faith communities that open shelter beds essentially for a week within their congregate spaces. So within their rec room, wherever they want to set it up. So we'll have 12 people who are committed to being in the program during the winter. Columbus House transports them to these sites in the evening and picks them up in the morning. And then the churches and the synagogues and the mosques do the incredible work of supporting these people, just like you just said. So they provide them with a meal, they provide them with entertainment, in your case, movies and conversation, they provide them with a safe, warm place to sleep. But the thing about Abraham's tent, Babs, is that it's not just that it creates these very badly needed shelter beds in the winter, it's that it creates these relationships that you just described, that it creates yes. conversation, that it connects people. We have congregations that do a week of service together. So you have the synagogue and the church down the street joining up to do the service together. You have all the congregations meeting at the beginning and end of the winter to talk about how the program is working. So the, the multiple levels of connection and community that that program builds are really beautiful to me. Um, there's something about Columbus House that I really treasure. And that's a program that is completely volunteer funded like it's completely funded out of donations so um that's the kind of thing that somebody donating today could support and if they wanted to put an earmark and say please fund abraham's tent totally okay with me we always okay. need, always need money for that i want to thank the congregations that participated in that because we haven't been able to do it in the last two years in the same way yeah. very much hoping that this year we'll be able to open it again yes and i want people to know that there's training so it's not like you know any old church can do it there's training, there's commitment, um, um, there's all kinds of things that happen before you can even get your, 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 your the first guests to come and stay at your church. So, and it's a big so deal because it. people stay up all night, right? This, the place yes. has to be staffed all night. And so all night. <laughs> I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, in some ways, volunteers tend to want a project that's like pretty time limited. They want to do something that's like for a few hours. But there's a way in which Abraham's tent is so hard that it also really energizes people because it's like, we're going to take on this really tough thing. Um, and that's a really amazing thing, too. I think it's really community building for the people within the congregation that signed up to do that, too. Well, it was one of it was one of one of the best things I've ever done. And we've done it over the years. Um, yeah, as a on my website, Babs. Babs said it was one of the best things she's ever done. It really, it, yes, you absolutely can. It, it really was quite moving, and I, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't. I, it was just. I just. It was just one of the most holiest things that you can do. It, it is at the heart of what my faith calls me to do: to be in service and um, to be in service to someone. That really was it. So thank you for exactly. thank you for reminding me of that, Margaret. I I, I appreciate that greatly. So, well, it's one of the great pleasures of working at Columbus House is getting to feel close to that work every day. And, you know, in my role, I really get to support people whose work is doing that every day. Um, and you're right. You, you didn't feel afraid and you made connection because it just reminds us that everybody is people, you know, people are people. And I tend to think that that's one of the reasons that homelessness persists is that we allow ourselves to believe that people are very different from us. And they're not. They're not. And if you spend spend a couple hours watching a movie with somebody, you're like, yeah, we both think this movie is ridiculous. We both think it's hilarious. You know, like this movie reminds you of your childhood. I also love to eat that. You know, people are people. Thank you so much, Margaret Middleton. I am happy that I got a chance to talk to you this morning. Likewise, Bob. Uh, it's so fun. Let's do it again before next year. Well, I, I hope you just come on my show and just be a yeah, guest. Yeah, exactly. Invite me. It'll be about. fun. Yeah. Can I come in person though? <laughs> well, you know what? We we've not opened up our studio fully. Oh. So so we're still doing stuff. I'm still doing stuff virtually. Uh Paul Bass is the only one that has been doing stuff in studio and we do pundits a couple of times a month in studio. So uh yeah, but perhaps well, listen, I'm so grateful to y'all because I think it's so special that you take the great give as an opportunity to share with this community all the work that's happening. Um through nonprofits. And I know I personally was like, it was irresistible to me yesterday to send out a bunch of checks. Like it really gets me every year. And so yeah. 
Yeah. Thank yeah. you guys for participating in that. I think it's a wonderful moment. It's great. Yeah, it's a great moment. It's a great moment. It is. It really is. And nobody else can dedicate this kind of time the way that we do to each of these organizations. So it is. It is uh, our pleasure to do it. So. Well, thank you thank very you, much, Marcia Middleton. Thank you, Bob. I look forward to talking to you soon. Likewise. Bye. All right. If y'all care about um, homelessness, send your money over there to Columbus House. The Great Give is in effect. We're doing it. And uh, I know of no better organization than the Columbus House.